You're a prison guard. You're a tough guy. You've seen it all. It's been a long day at work. You've just arrived home. As you reach into the fridge for a cold drink, you hear a noise, a knock at the door, kind of monotonous, also a drumming. You open the door. There are two children there, between 12 and 14 years old. They want to come in. They want you to invite them in. You don't know who they are. You don't know why they want to enter your house. They keep repeating the same question over and over. May we come in? And you get afraid. Why don't you just ask us in? Tell us to come in so we can use the phone. It'll only take a minute. You know something is wrong. And then you see they don't have normal eyes. They have completely black eyes. They're looking at you, and you're frightened. You're real frightened of these children. You shut the door. You lock it. You spend the night walking the halls of your house, worrying. And you, my friends, have reached the edge of the world. This is Whitley Strieber, and this is Dreamland. Today we're talking to Dave Weatherly, his book, The Black-Eyed Children. When I saw this book, my blood ran cold because I have had the experience that we're going to be talking about. And in the subscriber section, I'll go into detail about just what happened to me and let Dave tell me what he thinks was going on. Thinking about coming to the Dreamland Festival, well, there are a few seats left. So if you hurry, you can still get a place there, a couple of places there. But do hurry because we have under 10 seats left at this point. Dave Weatherly, welcome to Dreamland. Well, it's a real honor. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And Dave's website, or rather his blog, is 2 crowsparanormal.blogspot.com, and the two is spelled out. The book is The Black-Eyed Children. And Dave, you know, there was a time when I would have assumed that a book like this is a novel, but it's not, is it? No, it's not. It's fiction, and that makes it all the more frightening. It's It's not fiction. (laughs) Yeah, nonfiction. Nonfiction. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, uh, It is, it's been going on for quite a while now. This this whole phenomenon of the black-eyed children, hasn't it? It has. It originally became more widespread in the late 90s and around 2000 when some stories showed up on the Internet on various uh, blogs and discussion boards. And it's one of those things that people at first assumed could be an urban legend. And, in fact, when I first heard the stories, I thought, well, this is fascinating, but it may indeed be an urban legend. I ended up having an experience of uh, meeting someone who had experienced a direct encounter with these children and began looking into it more closely and realized, no, this indeed is not an urban legend, and it's, in fact, become more widespread over the last several years. Now, that's interesting because, you know, if you go on the Internet, you get a there's really a lot of stuff out there about this, and people... Or t- tell us why don't you get, why don't we do this? Uh, you didn't hear the intro I did for Dreamland, but we I I very briefly introduced the Paul case uh, and giving people a flavor of what it was like for him when he realized that these two children at his door were not normal. But tell us a little bit about the Paul case, if you will, because you've talked to him personally. How did you first get in touch with him, or did he get in touch with you? Well, I knew Paul uh, for some time, um, just as a, as an acquaintance. And Paul was one of those people that I'm sure a lot of uh, those involved in investigating paranormal have run into before. He professed that he was a complete skeptic, but at the same time, he couldn't seemed to leave the topic of the paranormal alone. He was always making cracks or jokes, and I sort of had this feeling that this is a man who can't leave this alone because he has a story himself. And finally, one day I was uh, having lunch, and I ran into Paul, and he asked if he could join me. And he sat down, and he started to open up. Now, 
this is a man who was, he was a prison guard. He'd had a, a very, what I would say, an, an intense life. I mean, he'd seen prison brawls and people shanked, and uh, there, there was nothing about this man that was weak in any way that we would uh, commonly believe. Well over six feet tall, bodybuilder, martial artist, broke down almost in tears when he related his story to me of encountering two children that showed up at his doorstep and instilled terror in him. And he could, he was still having trouble when I met him and had extensive conversations with him coming to grips with what had happened and why he had reacted to, in this way to two seeming children. At now, his doorstep. He, he was, he was in his kitchen and he'd just come home. And he heard this continuous knock, 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 knock at the door. Is that right? That's correct. And and that's typical of the way they announce themselves. Yes, it is. They never seem to use doorbells for some reason. Um, and as probably anyone would react, he, he stood there for a moment wondering exactly what the sound was. And when he realized someone was knocking and wondered why they hadn't used the doorbell, he went to the door and opened it. And uh, there are two young boys standing on his doorstep. And he began to have this exchange with them, trying to figure out who they were. He lived in a suburban neighborhood, knew everyone in the neighborhood, um, had a child himself, but his child was much younger, so he knew this wasn't any friends of his child. And he began to grow very uneasy talking to these boys. They were insisting that he invite them into the house. And but, but they didn't actually come in, and that that's consistent, isn't it? Yes, it is. They they don't cross the threshold. They try to convince the person to invite them in. And there's resistance. I mean, he, Paul was too scared. He was, and when he realized these boys had solid black eyes, the the fear in him just increased dramatically. He ended up slamming the door on them. Yeah. Bracing himself against the that, that, door. That would be one logical reaction. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, he crossed the room trying to shake off this feeling that he was experiencing because it, it was not something this man was used to. He was not a person used to being afraid. And to try to rationalize in his mind why he would be afraid of two children just standing on his doorstep, he... He couldn't comprehend what was happening. He crossed the room. The knocking continued. He turned and looked at the door and saw the face of one of these children staring in through the side panel, uh, through the glass at him. Yeah. And he was alone in the house? He was alone in the house. Oh, his my. Wife, his wife and child were out of town. And at this point, his, his fear possibly because he had backed off far from the door, his fear started to blend with anger. Yeah. And he, he felt almost rage and ran to his bedroom to get his revolver and uh, came out, you know, rushing out, determined to confront these boys and run them off. And this, this is not the kind of behavior that this man, this is a very controlled person well yeah especially someone in his profession is going to be very aware of the way the law works in regard to his use of that gun exactly exactly but he was determined to take that pistol and run these boys off of his property and and hopefully you know he, he honestly he hoped to frighten them the way they had frightened him but of course in the few moments it took him to rush to the bedroom grab his gun come back out when the door opened, these boys had vanished. Now, describe the boys precisely for us, will you? Sure. What they were wearing, how they stood, all of that. The, these boys, <clears throat> the average age in these encounters ranges from about 8 years old to around 13. Falling somewhere right in the middle is um, what the bulk of people who experience these children believe the age to be around 10 years old um, these two particular boys that Paul confronted were wearing just very nondescript clothing um, 
they were standing on his porch initially, sort of looking down, not directly at him. Their skin was rather pale. They had a very monotone way of speaking. They didn't seem to respond to questions that he asked them. He tried to, you know, I think you boys have the wrong house. Uh, and the response is, well, we'll just come in for a little while anyway. <laughs> uh, most people that encounter these children say that they believe the kids are trying to hypnotize them or exert some type of mind control but because the speech is always very monotone and there are constant phrases almost as if they've memorized phrases that they keep repeating over and over and over again. Like and and they come with that monotone, but you know that knocking is eerie because many people have heard that and then you may not know this and then open the door and found nothing there at all. Yeah, I've had that happen a number of times where there'll be this knock, 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 and I open the door and there's nobody there. Yeah, fortunately, and, and that occurs. Fortunately, that occurs uh, fairly often and and always with these cases. It's this long. It's described as a long continuous was not uh, you know, almost robotic or, or something and that has happened the, these children will knock on doors they'll knock on windows uh, car windows it, it seems to be part of their MO when they manifest Okay, we're going to take a little break now folks if you're a known country subscriber do listen to the subscriber part of this because it's going to be Real interesting. I've had this experience and in spades with a witness and, uh, <laughs> Dave and I have got some, some fascinating stuff to talk about with regard to that. When we get back on Dreamland, we're going to be asking the basic, most skeptical possible question. Is this just an urban legend or not? And then we're going to go beyond from there. We're going, going way beyond. We'll be right back. Dreamland listeners, now you can listen to or download Dreamland from the site or from iTunes. On iTunes, search podcasts for Dreamland. On your smartphone, download the Wonder Radio app and search stations for Dreamland. Solving the communion enigma. Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell says, interesting and challenging. Don't miss it. British Ministry of Defense UFO expert Nick Pope says, Enchanting in some places, disturbing in others. This fascinating book charts Whitley Strieber's attempts to make sense of his bizarre experiences. As he delves into his past and analyzes strange phenomena more generally, he formulates theories that may challenge views about the nature of reality and have profound implications for the future of the human race. And the kid has on a shirt with knife knife blades in it sticking out in rows all across the front of the shirt it was like a shirt made of knives wow it, unbelievable scariest damn thing i ever saw every week for unknown country subscribers something just as new just as fascinating plus as a subscriber you get access to every dreamland recorded for the past five years hundreds of subscriber interviews access to live chats with celebrity guests and our vibrant subscriber community we believe that this is by far the best offering of its kind on the internet so go to unknowncountry.com and click on that subscriber tab right now this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. I'm talking to David Weatherly, the Black-Eyed Children, a very, very eerie story. His blog, you can get it at twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com. That's twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com. Spell out the two. Dave, before we left the air, we were asking, I was beginning to get into the whole urban legend issue because... If you go on the Internet and look into this, you soon find that a lot of people characterize it as a complete urban legend. And so I want to ask you first, why wouldn't it be? Because none of your, why wouldn't we believe that? I mean, because none of your cases in here, the people are not identified. Uh, and you could, this could be a novel. It could be a work of fiction. That was one of the things I struggled with, to be honest, writing this book, Whitley. Uh, 
no one, none of these people wanted their names out there. They didn't want publicity. They didn't want to be on television. But ironically, that gave credence to the validity of their stories because what these people wanted was a chance to talk to someone about their experience and come to some kind of understanding so that they could move beyond what they had experienced. The interesting thing about this is that, as I said earlier, initially I thought perhaps this could be an urban legend. But when you start speaking to people who have had the experience, you realize there's something else going on here. And the skeptics, of course, will argue, well, <clears throat> you know, there are no photographs. We don't, we don't have a black-eyed child. But all those arguments could be made for any area of the paranormal. And a photograph is, is not suitable anyway because it is possible to, of course, replicate this or alter a photograph. Ultimately, what we have are people's experiences and their life changes experiences that these people have had. When I started researching the topic, one of the first things I did was I went back prior to the stories that had been posted on the Internet because I felt like if this was a phenomenon that was genuine, there must be something historically that connects. And indeed, that's what I found. I, I did find a number of cases that, uh, historical cases that well predated the popular stories that circulated on the internet in the 90s. Can you tell me, tell us, give us some examples? <clears throat> sure. One of the most, uh, fascinating ones was from uh, the 1950s. And it happened in a rural area, sort of a farming community, uh, and it occurred <clears throat> with this young man whose name was Harold. Harold was walking home one day and uh, walking along this country road. He came to the fence line that led to his house. And he sees a young boy leaning against the corner of the fence. And uh, Harold, having a very good nature, just walks up and starts talking to this boy. Doesn't recognize him, doesn't know him from the community. Uh, just starts chatting away. And this boy looks up at Harold and says, I want you to take me to your house. You take, you walk me up to your house. And Harold just sort of felt a chill with this boy's response. The boy didn't respond to any of Harold's questions. He just comes out with his comment, demanding to be carried up to Harold's house. And Harold is standing there thinking this is... Uh, not right, his hair is going up on the back of his neck. He's thinking, doesn't voice it, he's thinking about running up the driveway that leads to his house. And this boy's response is automatic. He says, now don't you run away from me, almost as if he's read Harold's mind. Now we could put that down to body language, but it's a very strange coincidence, if so. And when this happens, Harold has realized, looking at this boy, that this boy has solid black eyes. Harold's terrified. He starts running up the drive, heading for his house to get away from this boy. Partway up the drive, he hears what he described as the screech of a bobcat coming from this boy. And that sound is enough to help Harold break his personal record for reaching his front door. So, I have to just <laughs> add here, I've heard that sound in my woods at night in the country, mm. and I attributed it to the greys, to these beings. Right. Uh, cat-like scream. I've heard other sounds from them, too, but yeah. that cat-like unmistakable scream, and it's not a cat. When you hear it, there's no way it's a bobcat. It's something very much else, but I know where, where that you're, he's coming from with that. But and that's exactly what he said, that the closest thing he could relate it to was a bobcat, but he, he was convinced that it was not a bobcat. And what's fascinating about this story, Whitley, is that he, Harold, of course, he makes it to his, his house and he relates the story to his parents, and fortunately, Harold was a young man with a very good reputation. He wasn't known to, to lie or to fabricate stories. 
But his parents, his mother, automatically assumed, being the, the more simple country folk that they were, well, well, Harold has had an encounter with the devil. And, you know, she promptly took him to local clergy to get him blessed and to make sure his soul was safe. But what's interesting is that as the story is passed down, the black eyes were not the focus of the story. So, of course, in the 1950s, there was no term black-eyed children or, or BEKs or anything that denoted these particular beings. They just assumed Harold has met some kind of demonic entity, and the story as a whole was passed down that way, but the other aspects just has uh, focused on, you know, the, the, screen, the eerie scream and the idea that this young boy read Harold's mind. Those were all equally as important. And going back in history, this is this is what you find. There are cases of black-eyed beings. It's just that the eyes were not the sole focus of the encounter. You bring up another possibility in the book, if we're going to stay for just a few more minutes on the skeptical side of this. I'm a teenager. I read these stories on the Internet, and I realize it's not hard to buy black contact lenses. And I think to myself, yeah, I could have some fun with this. <laughs> What's the story about? You've re- you've gotten gone into this. Tell us about it. I have gone into this. I I had a skeptic who tried extremely hard to convince me that all the cases of black-eyed children or black-eyed beings were the result of uh, kids purchasing contact lenses and <clears throat> going out to terrify people. Now. I have issue with that. I, I have kids myself, and I can tell you they're much more interested in the latest music video or texting back and forth with their friends. And I actually talked to a lot of kids. I had my kids go out and network with their friends, and I just wanted to find out if this was something that was really happening, if this was something kids were really interested in. And most of them scoff at the idea that they're going to spend their time, money, and energy doing something for a brief kick that really has no payoff. Uh, these kids, the black-eyed children that manifest to people, they don't stick around to laugh about it. They tend to vanish very suddenly, which is not something that can be explained. There's a case in the book of a, a law enforcement officer, a, a sheriff's deputy, who had two of these kids essentially cornered on a deck when he opened the door of the house to try to find out why these kids were outside at uh, 3.30 in the morning. And these kids vanished. The only way they could have gotten off was to climb the railing and jump down into the yard. And we're talking about a few seconds, as long as it took him to turn his head and knock on the door. And this is a man who is trained in observation, trained in awareness. Uh, It's just not conceivable. As far as the contact argument, you know, it is possible to go out and buy these contacts. They cost around $300 for a decent pair. It's a contact lens that covers the entire eye. I spoke at length with a number of people who use them for costuming, and about 50% of the people have issue with peripheral vision when they're wearing these things. They have issue with uh, eye irritation. And uh, it's just not... uh, it's just not happening in most of these cases. Now, I will tell you, I, I do get a fair number of cases that come in that seem like they could be the result of a prank or a hoax, and those I tend to discard. Yeah, of course. And it, now, when what are, what are the earmarks of one that might look like a prank or a hoax? Well, there have been a couple that have shown up, and the kids... <clears throat> There was uh, a case recently with a pair of teenagers, and this woman thought that she had encountered a pair of these black-eyed kids, but none of the signs were typical. They had solid black eyes, but for one thing, they weren't very composed. They couldn't stop laughing towards the end of the encounter. Uh, They were trying to scare this woman, but they were doing things that were very uncharacteristic. They were very animated, which is very uncharacteristic of these black-eyed children. Uh, no one seems to see a whole lot of movement from these kids. They're not, there aren't
aren't typical um, uh, physical reactions from these from these kids when people encounter when, have a genuine encounter with black eyed children. When we get back, we're going to ask the question: What about the people who let them in? We'll be right back. One unknowncountry.com subscriber says, The subscriber offering has blossomed into an indispensable tool for my spiritual growth. Unknown Country has revitalized my sense of awe and wonder. I am very happy to participate in this exciting adventure. Listen to what another one has to say. I've been a subscriber to Unknown Country from almost the beginning. I get information there I can get nowhere else on the web. And think of what you get. Commercial free access to every Dreamland since 2004. Hundreds of special interviews. The Astonishing Meditations of Whitley Strieber. A small collection of UFO videos, but one that is rock-solid authentic, unlike so much you find elsewhere. Plus, the satisfaction of knowing that you support the best edge science website in the world. Unknown country, genuinely new, genuinely credible, like nothing else in the world. Subscribe today. We need you. And you'd be surprised. Once you start, you'll realize you need to be a part of this community, too. Click on that subscribe tab today. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. This is the edge of the world. And the kid has on a shirt with knife, knife blades in it, sticking out in rows all across the front of the shirt. It was like a shirt made of knives. Wow. It, unbelievable. Scariest damn thing I ever saw. Every week for unknown country subscribers, something just as new, just as fascinating. Plus, as a subscriber, you get access to every Dreamland recorded for the past five years, hundreds of subscriber interviews, access to live chats with celebrity guests, and our vibrant subscriber community. We believe that this is by far the best offering of its kind on the Internet. So go to unknowncountry.com and click on that subscriber tab right now. This is Ridley Strieber. We're back. We're talking to Dave Weatherly, the Black Eyed Children. You can get his book from Amazon. Where else can you get the book, David? The book is available at leprechaunpress.com. Leprechaunpress.com. It is not an ebook. It's a hard book you hold in your hands, which I love personally. You can also follow Dave's doings, his comings and goings, at twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com, twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com, and that's T-W-O. Now, David, these creatures, or whatever they are, and we're going to ask you later what you think they are, because you've got some very good ideas about this, they always ask to be let in, there must be people who say yes. Am I right? Most of the people who encounter these beings, <clears throat> because of the level of fear they experience, they don't invite them in. There are people who are, are tempted. There are people who experience uh, various states of confusion, trying to convince themselves to just let these children in, that everything's okay. There is one case that is fairly stunning. It's covered extensively in the book about a black-eyed child that was invited in. And he was invited in by another child. Oh, my. Tell hmm. us a little bit about this case, if you will. I will. The, the case was <clears throat> was pretty fascinating because it was one of the few cases I had seen with children encountering black-eyed children. And to uh, the brief synopsis of this case was uh, <clears throat> a woman who was driving home. She had her young son in the back of her SUV. Uh, she stopped by <clears throat> a local convenience store as she did on a regular basis, 
just to run in and grab some milk and bread. She left her child in the back seat, ran in the store, got what she needed, came back out, <clears throat> jumped in the driver's seat, looked in the rear view mirror and saw a pair of black eyes staring back at her. She no. was instantly terrified. She realized that this boy was sitting right next to her son in the back seat. He was on the inside of uh, of the seat. She so was and like sitting in the middle, and he, her son was on the side. That's correct. He slid over. Yes. Oh, no. No. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so she immediately, she immediately felt terror. She uh, leapt out of the car, jerked the back door open, and and yanked her son out of the SUV, ran back into the store, and of course at this clerk, at this point the clerk is uh, running from behind the counter asking what what's happening. He's wondering why this woman is is running in in a state of panic and the uh the clerk ends up going outside because she's kind of stuttering and stammering that someone's in her car he thinks this is possibly an attempted robbery or a carjacking he runs outside the suv is standing there in the parking lot with the two doors open not a sign of anyone mm -hmm. so as the story unfolds, this woman is, is too nervous and too shaken to even get back in the SUV. She ends up calling her husband, who's fairly close by. He comes over and tries to, to calm her down and says, look, I, I'll drive the SUV home. You, you take my vehicle. I'll meet you at the house. A couple of miles away, the husband is in an accident and totaled the SUV. He is sent to the hospital. The, the woman has tried to speak with her son about what's happened. As this unfolds, he says to her, well, <clears throat> mommy, this, uh, she says, well, why do you know, do you know this boy? Is he, uh, who, who was the boy, and is it someone you know from school? Well, no, Mommy. Well, why did he get in our car? Well, I invited him in. He, he asked if he could get in, and I invited him. I, I thought he would he would come and play. He said he wanted to come to our house. So here we have the innocence of a child who doesn't have a concept of those boundaries and, and from all evidence didn't feel any fear from this black-eyed child, simply thought it was another potential playmate, someone who, who would come and hang out at his house and play with his toys or whatever. <clears throat> but the story it gets even darker because the young boy who had invited this child into the SUV became very ill. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with the child because his symptoms seemed to continually cycle through different things. They, they thought he had the flu. They thought, um, I don't remember, they, they thought he had appendicitis. They thought he had the measles at one point. It's all these different things that are rotating through this child's body. And he, he was sick for quite a while. The, his mother is convinced that it was only through a lot of prayer and positive thought that the boy finally got well. And she's, she's quite convinced that she encountered something evil that day in the car. The husband was fortunate. He did recover. He only had fairly minor injuries from the accident, but uh, the whole family was very shaken by the experience. So it, 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 here's the thing that interests me. I read the whole book. I've been all over the Internet looking at this. I can't find a single story of somebody who let these kids in and then was able to tell about it. 
So I have to ask you this. People must let them in. The child let them in, but that didn't go all the way quite. Sometimes people must let them in. What do you think happens to those people? I think that they meet with great misfortune. I I really do. Uh, After speaking extensively with this family that did have a, a brief encounter with one being invited in, I almost shudder to think what would happen if someone invited one into their house. So obviously, we don't we don't have any, quote, survivor stories beyond this. Uh, so it's really only speculation at this point. But it's it's something that is, is very disturbing to think about, quite honestly. It's very disturbing because something is – Something real is going on out there. This is, you know, I know this because as I say, I've had this and there's an element in my case that we'll talk about later that is, suggests that this may be really, really almost like an intrusion from another form of reality or more accurately stated that this world we live in is simply not what it seems. Now, there are, you know, I had a lot of close encounter experiences and nothing ever needed to ask at the door to come in. Believe me, if they wanted to come in, they came in. This is different somehow. This seems to be almost like the vampire lore where a vampire can't enter your life unless you invite him across your threshold and accept that this is real. And that's what's making it creeping me out so much. And I have to be very very frank with you. When I realized, when your book came in across the transom here, that I wasn't alone, I was shocked. I had not looked this up before. I had not been aware of the fact that that single incident wasn't the only incident. I've barely mentioned it in my discussions of what's happened to me over the years. I've probably mentioned it a couple times in books I don't remember. In any case, uh, certainly I've mentioned it to people personally. We're going to take another little break. And when we get back, we're going to talk more about the paranormal aspects of this, which are very definitely there. On the Internet, there is a ghost story, a story about one of these black-eyed children. I'm going to read from it for just a second. This is a man. It's early morning hours, small hours of the morning on a street in Portland. And this guy has got this confrontation going with a young boy who seems to have completely black eyes. The boy is trying to get him engaged. He says, I'm lost and scared. Do you think you could give me a ride to my mom's house? The guy then writes, this kid didn't look scared at all. Masked behind those youthful features was the expression of a wolf leering at me. We will be right back. Ann Streber was overweight. A hundred pounds overweight. She tried diet after diet, but nothing worked. Then she discovered an extraordinary secret and took that hundred pounds off and kept it off. In her new ebook, What I Learned from the Fat Years, she tells you exactly how to really take off weight and how to keep it off. All kinds of great hints, plus a deep understanding of how diets actually work and why they work. What I Learned from the Fat Years. Diet Wisdom from Ann Streber. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. Go to unknowncountry.com and download your copy today. This is Whitley Strieber. Do you want to spend some quality time doing something really interesting? I mean really interesting. Explore the vast riches of the unknowncountry.com subscriber section. And you can find out what's there even if you aren't a subscriber. Take an example. Type Bermuda Triangle Interview into the Unknown Country search engine. 
Two interviews will come up, one from 2004 about an actual mayday call made by a pilot whose plane was in the process of disappearing. The next from January of 2011 with a pilot who flew through the mysterious electronic fog that has swallowed so many planes and survived. The unknowncountry.com subscriber section, unique in the world. Satisfy your soul. Satisfy your curiosity. Click on subscribe now on our homepage and join the adventure. Oh, David, David, David! I have to admit, I'm you're scaring me here. <laughs> <laughs> that that can't be easy to do. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> the Black-Eyed Children, Dave Weatherly's book, his blog, Two Crows Paranormal dot blogspot dot com. That's Two Crows Paranormal dot blogspot dot com. You spell out the two, and hey. Not a subscriber to unknowncountry.com. We rely on you. This doesn't show up anywhere, this kind of information. Nobody goes into it like we go into it. And not only that, we've been going into it for a lot of years. You can, if you subscribe, get a, get all the way back to 2004, every dreamland that has ever been recorded. The whole run of Ann Streber's mysterious powers, William Henry's <laughs> revelations, hundreds of special interviews. Don't miss out on this. This is something really special. Dave's book is also really special. The Black-Eyed Children, it's a well-worked-out, very readable book. Keep the lights on, though, I warn you. Uh, I, I Believe me, because gradually, over the course of reading this book, you realize that on some level, this this is real. It's really happening. But here's the question, Dave. What is happening? What are these things? You're the expert, the paranormal investigator. You've been looking at this for years. Where do you come out? Where I come out, and I I thoroughly examine, as you saw in the book, all the various possibilities that would explain what these beings are. Uh, I really made an effort to do a cross comparison because the the strange thing about this phenomena is that they actually share traits with a, a lot of different paranormal manifestations. There there are correlations between uh, demons or vampires, uh, ghosts, uh, alien hybrids, a, a vast array of different things. But my ultimate conclusion on a, a personal level, I believe that these beings are some type of, for lack of a better word, interdimensional being that are crossing over into our level of existence for some sinister purpose. A purpose we don't know. Exactly. Because the people who do invite them in are either gone or have no memory whatsoever of whatever happened to them. Exactly. There could be anything. These people could be possessed. We just have no idea what happens behind that closed door when these creatures are invited. Have you folks ever had an experience like this with the black-eyed children? If so, write Whitley at Streber.com because we want to know about it. David wants to know about it. We'll forward your emails on to him so he can maybe follow up. Uh, there's a wonderful chapter in the book called Dark Thoughts. A thought form is a creation of pure mental energy. Some ancient traditions teach us that the mind can be directed and focused so as to manifest on the physical level. Essentially, this means that enough mental focus, a thought or image, can become physically tangible. Could this explains some or all of the black-eyed children. My question here, are they coming out of us, David? Are we generating them? You know, that's a possibility. It's, it's very interesting you bring that particular chapter up, Whitley, because that's, uh, in fact, that's the, the focus of my next book is on uh, tulpas and thought forms. And that's 
is essentially what we're talking about when we delve into this aspect of the children. There does exist the possibility that it is our mental energy, our anxieties, our fears being focused and creating a manifestation that confronts us. And, you know, we we get into the power of the human mind, which we've barely tapped when we start looking at these possibilities. And some people would would maybe scoff at the idea, but this really is uh, a potential that explains these kids, especially when we look at some of the, the cases where these children appear to be omens of some kind of misfortune, almost as if it's a darker part of our consciousness manifesting somehow to perhaps alter our path because these encounters do change people's lives. They do. Uh, They never, uh, like Paul, obviously, was never the same. No, he wasn't. He still isn't. He he, he still isn't. And he's, he's a man who has spent a lot of time trying to ensure that he never feels that level of fear again. I can't blame him. I know I know where he's coming from. <laughs> One of the things that happens after this are changes in the way you dream and what you dream about. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? A lot of people who encounter these kids consider themselves haunted by the experience, for lack of a better term. They have difficulty sleeping. They sometimes need to go into the various kinds of therapy or treatment to help themselves um, be able to deal with, with going out in public. It's typical that the people who have encountered them, for instance, uh, at their place of employment or outside locations, have a great deal of difficulty ever returning to that place again. The people who encounter them in their homes often become very um, nervous about anyone showing up at their door. The the other cases that you're <clears throat> speaking about with the dreams is that people uh, find that they dream about these kids long after the encounter. They wake up believing uh, that they've heard knocking at their door or on their bedroom windows. And they're not sure whether this is something they were dreaming or whether it was happening again because they find themselves in that in-between state between uh, sleep and and wake uh, waking. And it, it's very traumatic for these people. These people, for uh, all intents and purposes, they're trauma victims. And that's really what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with people who've been traumatized and are trying to find whatever tools they can find to move beyond it. Many of these people turn to spiritual pursuits in order to find peace. Now, let me let me go down another path here. This is a dark path, admittedly. What if people are letting the black-eyed children in and don't remember doing it? In other words, what if the real source of Paul's fear and of people's nightmares after these experiences is, is they did let them in because there's an element of almost of hypnotic. It's almost hypnotic at times. And I wondered if these are just memories, screen memories, like the close encounter experience. People have these weird screen memories. I had them where you think you're seeing an owl or a deer and that's not really what it is at all. What if the memory of shutting the door is false, and they do let them in. That's very possible, Whitley, and it's something I have questioned, but hands down, every one of these people that have encountered the kids refuse to be hypnotized, refuse to be regressed. I have to tell you that's a to me, is a dead giveaway. There's some kind of mind control going on there, I think, because why not be hypnotized? Well, I I think you're right, and and it's it's very consistent in these counters that the people believe that these children are trying to exert some type of mind control. That's that's constant. In fact, there was one woman who, who was very fascinating because she was someone who had went through hypnosis in order to quit smoking, and she 
had difficulty initially when she was uh, using hypnosis being uh, put into a hypnotic state. But with some work with her, her hypnotherapist, she was able to achieve that and to stop smoking. And she said, she told me that the feeling from these children speaking to her was the same thing she experienced when she had hypnotherapy sessions. That's very disturbing because it's making me think that this is a much different thing from what it appears. David, we are coming, r- r- rolling toward the end of Dreamland. It seems like we've been talking for about five minutes. It's hard <laughs> to believe we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, folks, if you have had an encounter with black-eyed children, especially if there's more than one person involved who had this encounter, or God love you if you have a picture. And don't send me any pictures of kids with black uh, contact lenses. I'll charge you for the v- photo analysis and <laughs> retaliation. And we will know, believe me, uh, that we've got some excellent photo analyses, people at Unknown Country, as you all know. But if you've had an encounter and are willing to be hypnotized, write Whitley at Streber.com. Let us know. Let's keep going with this. The Black-Eyed Children, David Weatherly. You can get it from leprechaunpress.com. You can get it probably from amazon.com, I believe, I'm assuming. Uh, his blog, twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com, well worth following. And now we're going to go on in the subscriber section. I'm going to tell David my story, and we're also going to talk a little bit about Men in Black, because I've had a one of the most harrowing men in black experiences you'll ever hear of as well. So thank you very much for listening to Dreamland. Don't miss a single week of this great radio program. Where else are you going to get information like this in this kind of depth? The answer is, it just doesn't happen like this. Not like this. Anywhere else. You've been listening to Dreamland. Be sure to tune in again next week. Dreamland is brought to you by UnknownCountry.com and our family of subscribers. Our news editor is Ann Streber. Our science reporter is Linda Bolton Howe. Our